I know a lot of you uh, will be um, committee weary this week because of the amount, the amount of committees and the amount of time we've sat here, but we intend to move on um, and go on with the agenda items here. So, with that, I'll ask um, is there any apologies and any substitutions, Mark? Convener, there's, there's three apologies intimated to myself, uh, Councillors Logue, uh, Rorty and Councillor Wilson. Um, Councillor Kern and Councillor Shields will be uh, substituting um, respectively in terms of section standing order, sorry, 64A. Um, Michael, mm. uh, Kevin's uh, computer's been taken over to the Civic, so he will not be at this meeting today. Okay, thanks for that. Any further apologies, colleagues? No. Hey, colleagues, can I ask you, just to remind you, can you please stay on mute as, as long as you're not speaking and, and we'll go on with the meeting as quickly as possible. Um, declarations of interest, are there any declarations of interest in terms of ethical standards in public life? Now, I don't see any, I'm going to get the chat bar up, I should have done that first. Right, I don't see any, so... Then, colleagues, with that, I'll move on to item two. Now, item two is a retrospective look at the action the climate day together um, event, which was the first of three events which took place on Tuesday of this week. Now, I'm not sure how many of you uh, attended, but um, by all accounts, I think it was a roaring success. Um, and you know, a, a huge thanks goes to the team, uh, Fiona Tennant and her team for the preparement. And I've got to say, Councillor McNally, who's not on this call, it was absolutely outstanding. Will Day, the keynote speaker, was inspirational. And I think if you do nothing else, you can back and look at that alone. But I think the star of the day has got to go with Willie Goldie. It was absolutely outstanding. So well done, Willie. Now, I'll, I'll open it up just now if any of want to make any comment. And I know it's in the past, but if anybody wants to make any comments, positive or negative, I'll let, I'll let you come in. Wally, Wally Goldie. Thanks for your kind words, convener. <laughs> I was just going to say it was an excellent event, and if anyone gets the opportunity to have a look at it, it was really, really good. The keynote speeches with Heather Reid and with Will Day were fantastic and really, really thought provoking. But also, this tremendous poem uh, by some of the pupils. Was it Clyde Valley? Hi. The, the, yes. the pupils are from. Uh, it was really good, and they put a lot of work into it, a lot of effort into it, and it was really, I think we've got another two events coming up. It highlights the issues that we've got with the global emergency. I think the council did the right thing when it declared a, a global emergency. Uh, looking forward to the other events. Uh, first time taking part in anything like that, and I must admit I was absolutely petrified, particularly when my mic didn't work, but it seems to have gone quite well. So if you get a chance to look at it, if you don't get a chance to go to this one, try and catch one of the future ones because it was really good. Thanks, Kavina. Thanks, Willie. Um, so, with that, colleagues, we'll move on to item three, which is the Glasgow City Region Climate Adaptation Strategy and Action Plan 2020 to 2030. This is page 11 to 28 in your, your papers. I'm going to ask Nicole Patterson to come in and give us an overview of this report, please. Thanks, Nicole. Convener, thank you very much. Um, so this report, obviously not unrelated to the item which we've just discussed, it actually um, takes forward the work um, which the Council has been involved in with Climate Ready Clyde um, over the past three years. Um, the work with Climate Ready Clyde has been quite significant. You know that as a Council we recognise achieving net zero emissions is a real priority and it's reflected in the timeline for us to achieve this ambitious target by 2030. Climate Ready Clyde is an adaptation initiative managed by SNFR and supported and funded by regional based organisations, including North Lanarkshire Council. And the Council is represented by myself on the board and by Council officers involved in the strategic development activities. The purpose of the Climate Ready Clyde group as part of the Glasgow City region is to try and bring about this transformation to create a flourishing Glasgow City region that's climate resilient. And in the, the strategy, which covers a 10 year period from 2020 to 2030, as I say, developed in partnership with the membership, and it's the product of the last three years work. And it includes a range of risks and opportunities identified for the region, which are set out in 2.2 and 2.4 of the report. 
Importantly, the strategic action plan within the report shown in Appendix 2 provides a list of flagship actions which all councils have signed up to the principle of. They are of significant scale, and that's of importance for us to not only as North Lancashire Council to be able to meet our targets, but as part of that broader city region to be able to meet our targets. It has significant scale, significant <coughs> ambition, and it's key to deliver a whole systems <coughs> city region. So we have the broader city region contributions that are very much reflective of the collaboration across Climate Ready Clyde and the Council's own commitment to tackling that strand of climate action. It's recommended that the Environment and Transportation recognise that adaptation is a key aspect of the Council's climate activity, recognise the good work that Council officers have facilitated and progressed in partnership with the membership of Climate Ready Clyde, note the summary and detail of the adaptation strategy and action plan, and as a member of of the organisation Climate Ready Clyde approve the implementation of the adaptation strategy and action plan. And just to note to members that this is subject to the Glasgow City Region Cabinet approval um, later in June. I'm happy to take any questions, Convener. Thanks for that, Nicole. Um, I see Willie, uh, Councillor Goldie, Willie. It's just really a comment on that. It's really welcome that we're seeing some kind of partnership working across the local authorities because these, these issues are greater than individuals, authorities and even nations of that. So it's good to see collaboration going forward and it'd be interesting to see how the results pan out over the years. Okay, thanks for that, Willie. Uh, is there any other comments to, um, or comments or questions, colleagues? No. So can I then ask you to look at the recommendations and uh, approve the recommendations? Is that okay? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Which then now takes on colleagues on to item number four, country parks for the future and a progress update, and that's in page 29 to page 34. And again, I'm going to ask Nick, Nicole Patterson to come in and give an overview of this, please. Nicole? Convener, thank you very much again. So this report is the second <laughs> annual report, which provides an update on our implementation of the One Place One Plan report approved at committee in March 2020, which introduced to members the Country Parks for the Future programme, which as you remember is a 10 to 15 year delivery plan to create a shift in the way communities use the parks and green spaces, <coughs> very passive leisure use, and um, to a much more active and engaged way that delivers improvements in specific health, well-being and social outcomes as part of the Council's programme of work. The last update in November 2020 provided an update in the programme and sought approval for the development of a detailed programme of delivery for the park master plans and the early stage actions to progress this programme. We know that the pandemic has demonstrated the great importance of green space for health and well-being, and the Country Parks of the Future programme will build on this renewed interest in North Lancashire's parks and green spaces to ensure they meet the future needs of our communities. There are a number of facets which the report presents. Um, and it principally relates to um, the next two key aspects of development in that delivery of the master plan for Strathclyde Park. The two detailed design uh, areas which will be taken forward, um, if members recall, these were the areas which received um, the greatest level of public and community support in terms of the master plan delivery, and they relate to the potential Velo Park creation, including wider cycling facilities uh, within and connections to the park as well as a proposed gateway um, at Bells Hill. The report also outlines the infrastructure development to support walking and cycling through significant path widening, which is already largely taking place, um, principally throughout Strathclyde Park, and also the further consultation, which will be undertaken on circulation and through routes with insights to understand the users' needs within the park, and that's across all three country parks. Finally, and I think just as importantly, is an update on the recent work that the park team has undertaken to support outdoor education within Strathclyde Country Park, including the development of a unique outdoor shelter for education and events activities is presented within the report. Convener committee, there are three recommendations which the committee are asked to consider. And again, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks for that, Nicole. Again, another very positive report here, Cup colleagues. Have we got any questions or observations? Thanks, well, Willie. Thanks, Convener. Uh, the outdoor education aspects of it, Strathclyde Park, I think 
Nicole had said previously to me it was uh, primary sevens and ESN kids that we're using it just now. Is uh, that going to be expanded and is there plans to do similar initiatives in the other country parks? Nicole? Thank you, convener, and thank you, Councillor Goldie, for the question. Um, so, yes, at, at the moment, um, we've been running pilot programmes uh, in conjunction with our colleagues in education um, and their active schools teams. So, at the moment, it's pilot programmes. Um, it, it's restricted in terms of the, the, the use uh, of the park, but the, the education team have just brought forward uh, an enhanced programme, which will extend the use to other year groups and other schools, principally at this point focused on Strathclyde Country Park, just because of the and in fact, the feedback received from young people today is that it's the water sports that they have most enjoyed um, and, and the bushcraft activities, that, that type of activity. Um, so it's focused uh, at the moment on Strathclyde Country Park, but the other two country parks are absolutely uh, on the radar in terms of potential future use. Okay, thanks for that, Nicole. Um, I don't see any other names in the chat box. Um, so can I then point you to the re three recommendations in page 29 and ask you to... Don't see any way dissenting. So thanks very much for that, colleagues. Uh, moving on to item five, which is a community asset transfer request, Palace Craig Community Trust. And that is on page 35 to 58 of your papers. I'm going to ask Lizanne McMurray to take him in and give us uh, a run through of this uh, report. Lizanne. Thank you, convener. Linked directly to the strategic intent outlined in the Country Parks of the Future Master Plan, programme delivery. This report sets out the details of a community asset transfer request from Palace Rig Community Trust, together with the outcome of the assessment process. This is set out in full in Appendix 2 of your papers. The application has been fully assessed and considered in accordance with the community asset transfer policy. Again, a copy is included for reference in Appendix 3. As set out in paragraph 2.3, Palestra Community Trust is a not-for-profit voluntary organisation. Their proposal aims to make use of the visitor centre and surrounding areas to create a hub from which a range of services and activities can be delivered for the benefit of the community. Important for committee to note is the corresponding ambition set out within the Palestra Master Plan to develop a mixed management and delivery model with voluntary sector involvement in the management of the park. And if you look to paragraph 2.3.1, um, that covers that, that particular point in a bit more detail. The terms of the lease proposed by the group is set out in paragraph 2.6 and 2.6.1. And what we have added into the report um, for con context is the market values for the site, and that's outlined in paragraph 2.7. The assessment findings indicated that the community benefits due primarily uh, to its fit with the Parks Master Plan outweighs the potential for the Council um, to be able to, uh, I suppose, release um, market value in terms of, of the, the lease that's costs that are indicated there. Um, however, we looked in detail, as we always do in the community asset transfer um, at the organisation. And if the recommendation to approve, um, and you're happy to, to, to approach um, this community asset transfer on the basis of the recommendations, we would caveat that in terms of the safeguards that are set out in 2007. Community asset transfer frequently um, involves um, significant support being required by community organisations and community development being part of that. So I suppose what, what we're seeing in this recommendation to approve a community asset transfer is more work to be done over what will be a six month period while we will um, go through the terms of the, the lease agreement with the organisation if committee are, are minded to approve um, on a conditional um, basis, and this very often is is what um, underpins the success of a, a community asset transfer. That very close partnership working arrangement um, with the council, and it's clear from the assessment process that the group themselves have worked very very closely with the council in terms of getting us to to this stage. Um, 
convener, that's a, a brief summary of the content of the report and the recommendations are as on the first page. Thanks for that, Lizanne. I don't see any names in the chat bar. Um, yes, I do. <laughs> Councillor Goldie Wally. Thanks, convener. It's just uh, I'd like to thank officers for their support to people looking towards community asset transfer. I think it's a way forward for organisations, and I know that as councillors we're in a, a difficult position just now to talk about individual cases, but I think it's a positive move in the council to uh, help and assist those that are moving these things forward. Yeah, and Willie, I would actually echo that. I know in my own community who went through the same process and eventually got to the other side, and it's, it's a big benefit to the community. So I would encourage people to do the same. It's, a, it's not an easy process, but if you do it right, it's a, 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 a rewarding process. Um, colleagues, then, with no other names in the chat bar, can I point you to the recommendations on page 35, which there are two of there, to ask yeah. other people for them? I don't see any dissenting, so take that as approved. Thank you. Colleagues, we can move on to item six on your agenda, which is recover, recover NL community environment improvements. And it's on page 59 to 66 of your papers. I'm going to ask Nicole to go over the salient points in this report. Nicole. Thank you, convener. So as we've talked about already, obviously the COVID-19 has brought an increased reliance on our parks and green spaces as communities have sought to rely on them to undertake their daily exercise. This renaissance and green space use and the increasing reliance on local town centres, um, whilst welcomed, particularly around potential improvements in health and wellbeing, has brought new challenges for local communities and the council in serving them. So a key strand of the council's Recover NL programme is investment in a range of activities to help communities and partners help themselves, underpinned by key central support mechanisms, including an overarching public education and communication strategy, which we hope will breathe new vibrancy into North Lanarkshire as we recover. The intention is that this strand of Recover NL is truly a catalyst for change in culture, that we build capacity for communities and partners to help themselves, and that we work on key environmental issues and priorities together. There's a number of key strands presented and opportunities presented within the report, which include firstly, from the community learning and development team, a number of new developments and awards and accreditation opportunities for adults, families and young people. Second, community priority funding um, from the half million pound fund agreed by the council at its last budget, distributed to community boards. Thirdly, to work as part of the Keep Scotland Beautiful National Summer Clean campaign to kickstart um, litter picks, etc., and environmental activities within communities. Fourth, to provide, to provide support to communities across North Lanarkshire in terms of uh, picking up bags of litter, etc. And five, to harness additional funding from the COVID recovery budget, which will support enhanced education and enforcement activities across the next two year, two year period. There are two recommendations to committee convener, and as ever, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Nicole. Um, as a, yeah, um, Council Goldie Wally. Cheers, Michael. It's me again. <laughs> uh, it's just we're all aware of increasing fly tip and dog fill and anything we're doing to help that. Uh, not help the fly tipping, but but to resolve fly tipping and dog fouling is welcome. Just a couple of questions. Uh, page 63, 2.12 about CCTV units. Will these be fixed on mobile units uh, and how will we select the areas? And the other question is on page 63, 2.14. We're looking at an increased capacity of 400% in litter bins. I take it that's the bigger, smarter bins that we're talking about. Uh, and it just says, uh, a bit of key locations for them. Do we know how the key locations will be determined? Thanks, Convener. Uh, Nicole, do you want to come in and answer these couple of questions there? Thanks. Certainly do, Convener. Yeah, if I might take the, the second question first and then I'll ask my colleague Andrew just to come in on the CCTV uh, units. So, in terms of the, the litter bins, yes, the 400% relates to the increase in capacity. Um, the programme which we will deliver throughout North Lanarkshire, which will commence um, at the end of this month, will look to remove very many of the small capacity, uh, damaged, pole-mounted bins, um, very, very low capacity in historic locations. 
we'll look to remove those from across North Lanarkshire and put in, you're right, the larger capacity um, bins, which will be emptied uh, mechanically by our colleagues in waste services. So much cleaner, much higher capacity. And the importance is that some of the bins will be fitted with smart technology so that we are able to monitor the use of those bins. Um, so really the key here is that the, the capacity will be significantly increased, even though in terms of number count, there will be less bins. In terms of where the bins will be located, um, we have been working uh, quite closely uh, with communities. As I said, we'll work from the, the north of North Lanarkshire South um, to look at, I mean, there are a number of, of, of key priorities. So they need to be accessible for them to be mechanically emptied by waste services. They need to be in key routes in and out of pedestrianised areas, town centres, routes to schools, cemeteries, parks, etc., so that people are actually able to use them on the way back and forward. And I think the final key strand of this launch is actually what we're pushing most heavily is a take your little home message so that we support communities really to help themselves. The key here is we will provide um, litter collection and the opportunity for that litter, dog filing, etc., on the go when people are out and about. But we're asking that the council does provide um, litter and recycling provision at each and every uh, household, access to that at each and every household. So we're asking people where bins um, are already busy or if they can, that they take it home and dispose of it at home. So there's a, a combination of messages in here to try and effect a change. But we're not naive enough to think that every piece of litter will end up in a bin. So of course, we will back that up with them. Um, usual speed scene squads as well, Councillor Gordon. Okay, well, are you happy with that? Yeah, thank you. Um, Councillor Dillon, Wally Dillon. So, Nina, sorry, maybe, sorry, convener, maybe, maybe I was I was going to answer the first question, the, 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 uh, Councillor Goldie. Uh, yeah, and you Andrew. Sorry, sorry, convener. Um, yeah, just just to say yes, they they, they will be mobile. Um, they'll be mobile to, to an extent. I mean, it won't just be a case of we can take them down and you shift them on, but they will be mobile. Um, they'll link into our existing CCTV. Um, apparatus as well, so they'll be come back into the overall infrastructure we've got. Where are they going to be located? Um, I'm sure every elected member on here has got a, a location that would like to see a CCTV camera going in, but we do have you know, uh, um, complaints coming through to us, both through from the protective services side and also through the land services side as well. So we'll use that as the first indication of where the camera should start to go. Um, and then we'll link that into maybe preventative measures as well. So we can maybe remove cameras once we put boulders in, barriers in places as well. So they will be mobile. Supplementary chair, if possible, just to Andrew on the yeah, on CCTV. Yeah. Is there yeah. any limitations on uh, whether it needs electric supply from lampposts or that, where these can be located, or are they going to be kind of self-powering, shall we say? Yeah, that's that's when they'll, they'll be a mixture of both. Um, they'll be self-powering ones, but ones that are that do have a fairly lengthy battery life um, using solar power as well. So we appreciate that as a lot of the fly tipping takes place in areas where there simply isn't any street lighting. OK, thanks for that, Andrew. Uh, Wally, call it Councillor Doolan, Wally. Thanks. Well, I think you went on your mute. Can you hear me now? I hear you now. On you go. Thanks. Uh, convener, I hope you'll permit me to raise this point. And do you know what I mean when we're uh, debating this issue of community environmental improvements? And convener, the, the, the issue that I would like to see included in this when we're talking about improving the, the environmental issues within communities, etc., is this question of rats. Am I OK, convener, to continue with regards to this? Yeah, on you go, Well, I'll let you go, because I know, I know with the communications you have been getting, getting a lot of complaints, and I, I, I've been um, getting some complaints myself. I'll let you go on this occasion. It's not in, in this report, but I think it's... Uh, it is part of it, if you know what I mean, because, yeah, yeah. on you go. Thanks, you go. convener. I really appreciate that. Uh, no doubt, colleagues, I mean, I dare say the, the ward that we represent were not a mess from any other wards. Well, at least we're getting hammered here in this ward 
about infant infestation of rats within the community. And I'm not saying as isolated case cases, it seems to be common in an abundance right now. Now, this in no way, the comments that I make here today are no way a slight on the pest control officers or the environmental uh, department of North Lanarkshire Council. But we need to express and we need to be totally aware exactly what is going on within the communities with regards to the infestation of vermin. Now, it's all well being that people can sit back and they can say, well, OK, phone up, environmental will come out. But there is a growing concern with throughout our community, throughout my ward that I'm aware of, with the fact that, yeah, it's OK, environmental officers coming out to a garden and uh, giving tips, giving procedures to follow for the residents, etc. But it's not every person who has the finances to bring these people out to their homes. And I'm talking about homeowners here in particular, a eh, convener. Now, they're coming out, environmental officers will come out, they'll do their job, etc., which is welcomed by the people. But there's a growing concern, convener, that the source of this infestation is not being targeted or indeed identified by environmental. Now, I mean, whether it's coincidence, I don't know. I'm not proclaiming to be an environmental expert or anything like that. My own profession, I was a coal miner. That's what I belong to. But there is growing concern within the communities. Is it a coincidence that these rats, the infestation that the communities are suffering at the present time, is it due to new developments happening? Is it due to the excavation of land that is lay barren for 20, 30 years, whatever it may be? Now, I mean, it's a horrible aspect. I've had rats in my own back garden. People round about me have had rats there. I'm no arguing from a set, no, a self point, a, a self preservation, or anything like that. But there's growing concern. Now, I mean, we've come through a year of lockdown there. People have been stuck in their homes. A lot of mental illnesses, mental illnesses have come out, and people different things like that. But people are now afraid to be sitting out in their own back gardens because of the infestation that is hitting the communities that we represent. Please, Chair, I don't want to take up a lot of time in this meeting, but it's a very, very important issue. I mean, we've got people, and I'm talking here even council tenants. I have a 70-odd-year-old woman who looks after her, her, her grandson with autism. That woman has video footage of a rat scurrying across her worktops in her kitchen. Now, think how petrified that woman was. I went down and spoke to the woman. The woman was petrified. She was in tears. Where do we turn? We're, we're sitting there now. To me, all we're doing is we're all we're in people's back gardens or wherever it may be, but we're not hitting the main source of where this infestation is coming from. Thanks, convener. I appreciate the opportunity for uh, being allowed to express my concerns here okay. today. OK, Wally. Thanks for that. Wally, I'm going to ask Andrew McPherson, who's probably the best place to come in and maybe answer some of the questions you've asked there. And we haven't got a... You know, unfortunately, we've not got a magic wand in this one, and I know it's a big problem in certain areas. And the last year has been a difficult year for you know, rats have been looking for different sources of food because they've been upset with the COVID lockdown as well. So, Andrew, do you want to come in and maybe uh, come, come back with some questions, uh, answers there, please? 
Yeah, I can certainly do that. Can be around just to, you know, for the boys down, because I don't, I don't, we don't take any slight at all. I know you would never mean it that way, and it's certainly not taken that way uh, either. Yeah, I, I, the conveners really sort of highlighted one of the issues that, that we've had, and this is not an exclusive problem to, to, to North Lanarkshire. If you look across most of the, the central belt local authorities, they've had a similar type issue in terms of the number of uh, rat complaints uh, within the sort of more urban environment now. Um, and that's a result of their, their normal food source uh, being closed down. In other words, uh, a lot of the restaurants, shops um, that, that, had, that provided that um, nourishment for the rats is no longer there, so they've had to move elsewhere um, for, their, for their food. And that's the reason why rats move into an area, because they need food. It's a food source that they're always looking for. Um, so we've, we we certainly do have the pest control service. I appreciate that there's, there's a charge with that now. It's, that's not a decision that we can make, obviously, to remove that charge. Um, that charge is, is very much in, in line with it. It's certainly very much more competitive than any pest control firm. Um, and as I would suggest, it's probably less than, than most other local authorities out there that do charge for that. But we also have to bear in mind that all council tenants will receive a free service. So I say that's a free service. It's a free point of um, contact for them. It is included within their overall rent. It comes out of the housing revenue account, but they, they are not charged up front um, for any service. We have been in touch with um, Building Standards and Planning, uh, Councillor Gold, because I, um, sorry, um, Dolan, because you, the specific um, issue that referred to there was, um, you know, there was a, a, a movement in, in the earthworks and also a demolition uh, locally as well um, about how we can get um, sight of any proposed demolition works in advance. Um, it's not a condition that can be put on in a planning consent, but we can certainly speak to the developer so there's a, a proper pest control risk assessment undertaking on the site. So if there is any evidence of any you know, infestation, then that's addressed before they actually undertake any uh, demolition. Um, so we are aware of the problem. We we um, we we are aware of the the number of uh, um, increasing the, the the number of calls about uh, rat complaints that we are now receiving, and um, in line with a, a previous um, request and recommendation um, to a committee, uh, there will be a report coming um, in the next cycle um, on the number of um, rodent complaints that we are receiving and also the action that's been taken um, by the council. Um, that will also include the £150,000 one-off funding, which has been provided this year uh, for proactive um, uh, action to actually prevent the very things that you're, you've, you've, you've just been talking about. But hopefully, as we move through the recovery period, as things start to open up, then you know, rats will revert back to where the easiest food source is, um, and that will be back to you know where, where they usually were. But I have to say that um, when we do go out, to actually treat rodent uh, infestations, it's quite clear and quite apparent where the food source is, and it tends to be within back garden areas, incorrect storage of waste, people um, feeding birds excessively, that type of thing. That is a, a, a major problem for us, as well as undertaking you know repairs to houses to prevent ingress to 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 the rodents as well. So hopefully that's answered some of the points there and gives you uh, something else that we're coming back to committee in August. Thank you. Well, are you happy with that? Uh, no, Chair, I'm not happy with Andrew's report back there, but Andrew, I have to once again remind you again, there was no demolition work taking place on this land area well, of land. Well, well, I can I maybe stop you there, because we are sort of drifting away from the, the, the actual report. I know what you're saying. And I think you should maybe we'll speak to well, um, to Andrew offline about that, that the individual uh, aspect of what you're talking about just now. Is that OK? Yeah, Chair, but can I make a, a, a point, please, Quite Chair? Point you go. That the quick point being that the infestation of rats has not only came at, during the period of the lockdown. We had it prior to the lockdown, Andrew. And what I'm saying, and it's people, the consensus, the opinion of the people, that with the excavation of this land that has lain barren for all these years, 25 years or whatever it may be, since the hospital closed, Andrew, this is unsettling the wildlife there. We're even getting deer running into our clo on our roadways, etc. But I have to say, Andrew, it's not only attributed to the lockdown, please. And I don't mean that disrespectful to yourself. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Andrew. 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 Thank you, And
Okay, thanks, Willie. But now, colleagues, we've got a few other um, um, uh, councillors want to come in on this. Can I please ask you to stick to the report? I know I was indulged in Willie there, and I'm not you know, saying that Willie's different from anybody else, but we really need to stick to the report we have in front of us. Um, councillor Carrier, Tracy. Thanks, Michael. Um, I want to go back to the report that Willie and um, the removal of the smaller bins for the higher capacity um, smart ones. That will obviously leave some areas without bins. Is that final? Um, if we if we then find that there is um, like rubbish or fly tip in there, will we be able to look at that again and have a bin placed in that area? And I kind of excuse me, a wee bit my company just link that to what Willie brought in there because if there is litter lying in areas, that could be a, a, a food source for rats and then we could actually be encouraging um, rats to come to that area. So I, ju I just want to know that if a bin is removed and we find that it's a, a problem area, that we're going to re look at that again and replace the bin there. Thanks. Yeah. Nicole, do you want to come in there? Please. Of course, convener. Thank you. Um, so, Councillor Callagher, um, yeah. So, the, the the assessment that's been made of the bin position has been to try and maximise their use and availability um, for any member of the community or any member of the public to use. The reality is, though, that the, the bins are um, they are not fixed in place. They are they are difficult for an individual to move, but they're not difficult for us to move. So, if there is a need to move bins to a, a location where we can get better usage, then of course it's in all of our interest to do that. And it's part of the reason for using the smart technology in some of the bins so that we can do that anything. Because the truth of the matter is the global number of bins is more fixed in terms of litter bins that we'll put in because each of those has quite a significant servicing cost. So what we're trying to do is get the right capacity of bin clean so that people want to use them in the right places where they are most used. But you know, I don't want to hide from the fact that if you are a, a dog walker, for example, that you know you normally had a pole mounted bin in quite a remote location, there will not be a new bin going back in that location, but it will be on your route. And if not, then there will be a bin available at home, um, as always, with that capacity provided by the council to dispose of it thoughtfully. I'm very clear that even the provision of litter bins, of course, doesn't encourage um, everyone to use those bins, um, but we will we will monitor that, and we've actually we'll, we will work in partnership with Keep Scotland and Beautiful to get metrics both before some of those surveys have already been done, and the amount of litter which lies around our litter bins at the moment, i.e., doesn't make it to the bin for whatever reason, and then after, because what other local authorities have seen on the implementation of these larger um, capacity bins is that for whatever reason it does actually encourage more people to use them. And to be honest, that's what we're all about. So there is some movement in the bins in summary. We, we can uh, move them around to a degree uh, and obviously match up the, the collection schedules around that. So there is a degree of movement, but not for an exponential rise in, in number and therefore servicing of the bins. I hope that helps. Tracy, you okay with that? Yeah, um, just come back just a, a wee bit about it. Are, are we going to be, get, be getting, um, as each individual ward, will we get an update on what bins are going to be removed then? Like, I think specifically when in park areas as, uh, as well. Um, and sorry, just picking up on that. So if we got a fixed amount of these bins and that's all we'll have, we will not get any more. They'll simply be moved about. I think it's intention of the service to bring it to the town boards when it's you know, the rollout is going to be in your area. Uh, but uh, Nicole, do you want to maybe firm up on that a wee bit, please? Yeah, no, you, you're exactly correct. Um, so, as I said, the, the rollout will commence in the north of North Lanarkshire. So, over the past number of months, we have shared um, both the existing bin locations and the proposed bin locations um, with the community council there. And we'll take the discussion to the community board um, early next month before the rollout. But I would say it's, I don't think we should focus so much on the number of bins. We are looking at a 400 per cent increase in capacity. And it is absolutely in all of our interests to get these in the highest footfall, the highest use areas. And that's what we intend to do. But the work um, which we've done today in terms of the initial placement of bins has very much drawn on local knowledge, knowledge of the individuals who are emptying the bins and the frequency with which they currently need emptied so that we've used the best data that we've got going forward. And we will continue to collect that data and refine the position of the bins because that's what's in all of our interests. 
Thanks for that, Nicole. Um, moving on to Councillor Cullen, David. Thanks, Chair. Um, I welcome the, the report and I look forward to seeing the the consequences of the actions that are detailed in the report. What I would say is that the out with housing issues, I suppose, for all these litter fly tipping, dog fouling, and of course rats are the biggest environmental concerns for people in the local area. Um, it's good to see that there's initiatives in there, for, for example, the detached youth work team, and hopefully it's about education. I'm not just picking on young people here, but you know, the area that both myself and Councillor Damasio live in, live in is blighted by litter between sort of Forest Street all the way down to our road every lunchtime. And hopefully these teams can, can actually work with young people to, to explain the consequences and the costs of what they do. Um, in terms of fly tipping, the cameras will make a difference in, and I look forward to a report that details what who's been caught because they're culprits, they're caught, that it's criminal what these people do. And hopefully the consequences of their actions are widely publicised across North Lanarkshire. I mean, let's not hide this now. If people are caught, there needs to be severe consequences, and I know that's above our pay grade, but that's something we should push for nationally, that the consequences of fly tipping, at the moment, it doesn't outweigh the cost. We need to reverse that and change that. But I look forward to public awareness, public education, because that's the start. We can have the carrot and the stick. We can't have one or the other. We've got to have both. Um, but I look forward to seeing what the, the improvements that hopefully the report will will provide for local constituents because it is the biggest bugbear. Certainly most of these will, will get around issues like that. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, David. It's very, very welcome comments there. I, I, I agree with you entirely. Um, you know, the, the fly tip and the you know the, the fines that are handed out just now are you know minuscule in comparison to some of the cleanup operations that it has to be undertaken and it's time and time again. So no thanks for that. Uh, moving on to Councillor Lennon, Greg. Chair, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay, Chair? I'm having a wee bit of technical question with this device. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you okay, Greg. On you go. Perfect. Thank you very much. It's one of the council that will post this. Normally, I would uh, fully welcome investment, especially in detection methods of fly tipping, which could lead to potential prosecution. However, one of the concerns that I have not seen in a previous committee and in, in detection and then any sort of prosecution that have led on to that. I was one of the next site and CCTR and the authority. Did you get that there? I seen I had a wee bit of interference. Yeah, we can hear you. You, you were breaking up. I think if you turn your camera off, Greg, it might be a bit, bit, bit better. On you go. I'll do that in the room, Chair, just to make sure it's done. So, to go back to my point, Chair, just to reaffirm it. So, Councillor Cullen raised the fact that a fly tipping and potential prosecutions with the CCTV and how he welcomed that. I too welcome any investment in this area of the Council, especially if we're looking to take forward prosecutions for those fly tipping illegally throughout the authority. However, the question that I've raised previously at committee and I'll raise again today, how many detections have we had that has led to a positive prosecution in relation to fly tipping across the authority? And in addition, Chair, if you indulge me a wee bit further, to come back to Councillor Doolan's points in relation to rat infestations, now I'm aware that you certainly don't want this agenda item bogged down by, by that subject matter, and I'm certainly no one to champion. Uh, uh, rat issues locally, but one of the key points that I would raise is, as you, I and Councillor Dillon, as elected members for that ward, have received significant complaints over the piece in relation to the issues local residents are facing. So I would ask Andrew and his colleagues what research has been conducted regarding the migration of airmen coming to these development sites? Because one of the key considerations for us, although we've seen some increase in fly tipping in the periphery of the area, it can solely be based on the fact that we've got high levels of rubbish and various other things happening in our ward area. Now, I'm sure that other areas, as we start to go through the, the remaining years, when developments increase in other areas, they may see potential links 
to, to vermin infestation and various other stuff like that. So it's to come back to that question. And the other point would be to Andrew again, in relation to the current rat reportings or the vermin reportings that's currently taking place in Middlesbrough, have we seen a significant increase in those, especially in the past year, considering the fact that the developments have took place, or is it just a normal standard sort of a number that, that, that would be in any area? Thank you, Chair. Hey, Nicole, I'll ask you to come in the first part of that, and then I'll bring Andrew in. But again, but, um, Greg, we are really de dealing with ward issues here. And this is a committee meeting, not a you know, not a surgery. Um, so I'll ask Andrew to come in, but we need to try and stick to the, the agenda items as much as possible. Nicole. Convener, I hope Andrew forgives me, but he is actually better placed to come in on the issues raised. <laughs> on you go, Andrew. Sorry, Nicole. <laughs> That's, that's a good body swear for that one, isn't it? Um, yeah, so, no, um, no take, breaking up the, the first point, um, Councillor Lennon, just on the, the, the prosecutions, I'll be quite blunt with you, the prosecutions that we will have, well, you could probably count in one hand, but the prosecutions that probably SIBA have had, you could probably count in one hand as well. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, the, the level of fly tipping that local authority is involved in um, is supposed to be low level fly tipping. Um, so it's the it's the dumping of um, black bags or, you know, a, maybe a, a, a small um, um, van load of fly tipping. Anything larger than that, which would warrant prosecution, really should sit with SEPA. And SEPA are the, the primary enforcing authority for fly tipping. What, what is, what's happened for local authorities is that we're encouraged to issue fixed penalty notices as opposed to prosecutions uh, for fly tipping. Um, and that's the, the course of action that we take. Um, but what I'll do, Councillor Lennon, if it's okay with yourself, um, I can actually get the figures for you in terms of the number of fixed penalty notices and prosecutions that have taken place over the last um, three years. If that's okay, I can have that information and we'll pass that on to you. Um, and I'm, I'm conscious, convener, that they've the, the, perhaps covered this, but the, the, the rats, um, we will be bringing a report to, to the next committee, so we'll go into further detail um, on it there. Again, with regards to the, the numbers of rat complaints within the, the, the Moody's Burn um, area, again, if it's okay with yourself, Councillor Lennon, I'll be able to get that information and report directly back to you. Um, but I would like to emphasise the fact that just because a, a, a place is um, subject to some sort of ground movement or demolition or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean that's the cause of the rats. The rats will only exist if there's a food source there. If there is no food source, there are there are no rats. So it's it's important that you though we do have to look um, about where they're actually coming um, to to have the, the to actually um, feed, and that's one of the most uh, the most important things because we whenever we do, I want to sort of go back in the point again. But whenever we're called out to rat complaints, we can normally very quickly ascertain where the source of that food is coming from. Thanks for that, Andrew. Andrew, I think, um, especially on the, the fly tipping uh, statistics, you maybe pass that, that information on to all, all members of the committee as well. Please, that would be useful. And I think I remember seeing this in 2017, just at the start of the last Scottish Parliament. Um, and I'm going to say it again. I think uh, with the new environmental team and the, the Scottish Government, I think it's high time they gave SEPA some more teeth and, and gave them teeth and got them kicked into action because SEPA are you know, much more prevalent when it comes to this fly tip issue, because as a local authority, you know, we can do what we can do, but as a national, uh, and I think it's got to be a national approach to what's happening in our, our communities. So um, I hope the, the Scottish Government, I'm, I'm sure they will, uh, look at this with um, at, at the first opportunity. So we'll go back Chair, to the... supplementary, if that's okay. On you go, Supplementary. Uh, just, I'm sorry to interrupt your, your high pro, uh, promotion of the Scottish Government there. I'm sorry to interrupt that, Chair. You know, you However, know, I'm always, I'm always fair. And, uh, as I said, there's never been a bigger fan than I've met, Chair. Uh, but again, one of the key points that I would raise in this, you highlighted an important issue there, Chair. It's not a ward issue, this committee. And I fully agree with that. So perhaps the first uh, uh, the point was perhaps missed. The key point I'm trying to make here is, is obviously in relation to the rat issue. If it's a case there's any research, it's sitting out there, Chair, especially when it's development sites, because it's not going to be a unique position just for Moody's Burn. I imagine other areas will experience the same problems. So I'm just happy to clarify that point, Chair. OK, thanks, Greg. Um, I'm going back to the chat bar here. I see Karen uh, McManus, Councillor McManus, withdrew his comments. So, Willie, 
Councillor Dillon, do you want to come back in? Thank well, on you go. Thanks, thanks, convener. Convener, it was just to see if consideration have been has been given by our env environmental team to the aspect of the the position as it stands in our byway. We, I know within my own community, and I'm not going into ward matters or whatever, but we see one ref, one letter picker going about the community. Now, I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong with it, convener, but my understanding is that the letter picker will go about with the black, black bin bag picking up the letter, then they'll, they'll deposit it at a strategic point to be picked up later later on that day or whenever it is by vehicle transport. Now, convener, I'm quite sure that a lot of us have witnessed it throughout communities whereby where these bags are deposited, that they're being attacked by seagulls, crows, birds, everything like that. The bags are being burst open and the litter is then strewn throughout the community. Has there been further consideration given by the environmental team in relation to changing this uh, procedure that we're using at the present moment of time? Thanks, convener. Yeah, thanks for that, Willie. Um, Nicole, would you like to answer them, that question? I, I certainly will, convener. Thank you. Um, so, Councillor, you, you're correct in some communities, um, depending on resources, uh, that is the method that's used, and it is a, a method which is widely used across local authorities. You'll be conscious that over the last uh, some 14, 15 months, there have been significant restrictions on um, the, the, the levels of vehicle use and manpower due to COVID restrictions to ensure that we keep our, our teams safe. But the method of um, collecting litter, tying it up in a bag and putting it at a collection point, usually for a pickup to collect uh, later that afternoon, is one which is well used. There may be, um, at times, just as when we each put out our, our bins, um, that there, there are some attacks uh, on that. But I guess I would want to step back from, and if you forgive me for this, some issues which are perhaps peripheral to the key issue here, which is one of littering in our communities. And it's the one which the report really tries to highlight as a strand, because what is most remarkable about the, the environmental issues which we're talking about this afternoon is that pretty much every one of them is avoidable by different behaviours being employed by each and every one of us. So all littering, fly tipping, um, graffiti, uh, dog fouling um, it, uh, and fly tipping is, is all avoidable. So the real thrust of this report is to work in partnership with communities to work together because what we've seen is unprecedented levels. And I'm afraid that that one litter picker um, who I always admire, regardless of the community within which the letter picker is working, because their job in many ways is a thankless task, and they do the same thing day in, day out. And the work is entirely avoidable, because if all that litter ends up in the right place, that we take it home, that it ends up in the litter bin, then it simply isn't there to collect. Now, the work of the teams in terms of detritus, of course, is quite different. Detritus isn't avoidable, but when we look at littering, it is avoidable and it is down to, and, and listen, I, I would not put this at the door of young people either. This is down to communities in their entirety, looking at some of those behaviours and help working with us to tackle them together. And I'm very clear that not one of us, either in the community or in the local authority, will be able to tackle this alone. It really needs a joint approach and it's the thrust of this report. Okay, thanks for that, Nicole. Colleagues, I'm now going to direct you to the recommendations on page 59, which there's two of. Can I ask you to approve the recommendations? Okay, thanks, colleagues. I don't see any dissenting. So, we're going to move on to item number seven, which is the Green Space Health and Wellbeing Update, and that's on page 67 of your paper, colleagues. Now, this here, this report is only here for noting, um, and so I would ask um, that. I'm sure you've all read the report. So I would ask if there are any quote comments or questions at this point in time on item seven. Uh, yep. Councillor Goldie Wally. Thanks, Convener. Uh, 
just interesting. I thought it was a, a good report and it highlighted a lot of issues. The page 68 to 2.1, uh, we've got a problem over lockdown from access to parks for older people. Now, I had a chat with Nicole and things with cafes being shut and various things, family members obviously not, of, not able to take them during lockdown or that. It's probably one of the main reasons for that. But when speaking to one of my colleagues, uh, they raised the point of people with disabilities and the restrictions within the park and the closing of disabled toilets. Now, um, I know that a lot of it's to do with the COVID pandemic or that. What level can we open disabled toilets up at? Can we open them at level two or are they likely to remain closed or is there anything that we can do to assist people? with disabilities and elderly people that require toilet facilities just to try and get them using the green space again. Thanks, Gavina. Well, thanks for that. Well, that's a very good question. I've experienced it myself. Uh, Nicole, do you want to come in and answer that, please? Of course, yeah. So I have to admit that there hasn't necessarily been many positives come out of the pandemic, but one has been um, witnessing that increased use of green space, particularly around our country parks. Um, alarming at times, I have to say, with the number of people in the park sometimes with the, the restrictions, but it is great to see people um, out exercising. Um, and I have to say from, from all demographics um, using the parks, we've been very mindful all the way through um, and trying to, I suppose, preempt within the, the, the guidelines which the government uh, issues and, and, and the restrictions that we are able to offer um, the opportunity for as many people to enjoy our parks and green spaces as possible. So, for example, in Strathclyde Park, when we became aware that the closure of the one of the car parks um, in, in relation to the through route was providing um, really limited access opportunities, particularly for disabled users, um, we, we've changed the barrier arrangement and reopened that car park to try and allow as many people as possible to enjoy the park. The question of public toilets um, is a, a difficult one. Um, because it will be some time before uh, both the government restrictions allow us to open the public toilets and we feel that the configuration of toilets that we have within the country parks is able to be opened safely. So what we have done in the meantime is work with colleagues um, in Sustrans and Safer Places, Safer, Safer Places funding and we have invested in a portal of toilet provision, basically at the parks, which does include um, disabled toilet provision. So whilst we can open up the regular toilet provision, we have tried to put in place um, alternatives. And the teams, including the members based at the parks, will continue to take feedback from any users if there are any concerns, or indeed we need, we need more units. Um, at the end of the day, I've said it repeatedly um, throughout the meeting today in the, the various papers, Green space use is, is welcomed. The beneficial impacts on people's health and well-being um, is welcome, and, and we want to ensure that as many people can use the parks as possible. So happy to receive that feedback. Thanks for that, uh, Nicole. Um, Nora, Nora, uh, Councillor Mooney, do you want to come in? You've got a quick question there. Uh, just very quickly on that point, um, Nicole. Uh, uh, from Pellet, I do know that there's um, the radar keys do you uh, get used in the disabled toilets, especially um, on a Saturday and a Sunday when park runs been on in the past. But I noticed there's been a barrier put in front of the actual disabled toilets to prevent that being done. But is there any plans to take the barrier away? Because surely it would make more sense for people to be able to use the disabled toilets with their radar keys and put in a, a portal for them. Nicole. Thanks, convener. Thanks for the, the question, uh, Councillor Mooney. So my understanding at this point is that in terms of people using the facilities, although the disabled facilities are normally only a single unit, that we still have some difficulty in being able to ensure that there is a standard of cleanliness, etc., which is suitable in a COVID environment. And I emphasise that not normally, because the, the entire area would need to be sanitised before use. It is much easier controlled within portaloos, and, and you'll be aware, I've no doubt, um, following the lifting of restrictions and being able to, to travel, that of course the National Park Authority and many other local authorities have utilised portaloos and um, hand gels, sanitation, etc., to try and meet that demand. So, as I say, 
there are alternative facilities. We are not using the facilities in the buildings which we have currently. Um, and if there is difficulties with access to the, the portaloos, uh, particularly the disabled portaloos, or there is a requirement for more, then I'm happy to take that on board uh, and, and have that investment made at the parks. Thanks for that, Nicole. Um, you happy with that, Nora? Yeah, okay. Colleagues, then, can I point you to the recommendations on page 65, 67, sorry, which are a few of, and can I ask you to note them and uh, approve them? Thank you. Agreed. Thanks. Now, we're moving on to item number eight on the agenda, which is on page 71 to 78, and it's the, uh, sorry about that. Right. Uh, and it's the weed control review. Now, there's a substantial report here. I'm going to ask Nicole to go through the salient points of this report. Nicole. Convener, thank you. I, I am conscious that it is quite a substantial report in terms of the, the detail and um, the complexity within it. So if you bear with me, I will take you through the salient points um, and then, of course, I will take any questions. So members will be aware that the um, Glyphosate following a motion to Council on the 4th of April 2019, but the Council recognised the health and environmental concerns um, outlined in section 1.2 of the report um, and, and asked that we look at potential alternatives. In section 1.5, the subsequent motion um, brought uh, last August to ban the use of glyphosate and to request an environmental impact assessment, which has been commissioned, um, was made. And as per section 1.7, the Council glyphosate with effect from the date of the motion um, in August 2020 last year. It is, however, clear, and it has been since the initial motion in 2019, that there is very much a lack of suitable effective alternatives. And the reason for bringing this paper to the committee today is, is to be very clear that we do not at this time have a suitable effective alternative. Um, and in fact, it appears that there has not been a suitable effective alternative identified within any local authority. And that, of course, as the growing season um, is upon us, that we will begin to see significant weed growth um, across our parks, green spaces, town centres, cemeteries, um, and all other environments that we're familiar with, so road edges that we're familiar with seeing weeds. So if I if I give you a bit of background against that, um, Glyphosate is one of the key tools for local authorities in terms of weed control, um, and it has been for some years. We recognise the concerns over the use of glyphosate in terms of both health and environmental concerns, but note in terms of the report uh, which this is drawn from that 90% of that use is within the agriculture industry, and that's laid out in section 5.3.4 of the approach. In terms of our current approach, we previously um, undertook two treatments um, of glyphosate uh, to most of these areas which were uh, heavily weeded throughout the year. Obviously, it was impacted by rainfall, um, etc. But in the main, two treatments were carried out um, and it had varying degrees of effectiveness. As I mentioned, we have looked um, at potential alternatives and indeed only a handful of local authorities in the UK have trialled or looked to adopt alternative methods. In 5.2.7, um, I start to talk about the potential alternative methods which could be employed. Section 2.7 and 2.8, which why I couldn't find it in my report. Sections 2.7 and 2.8, we begin to look at what potential alternative weed control mechanism could be. And you'll note that in a 2015 DEFRA report in section 2.8, that they studied the costs of what's called an integrated pest management approach. Um, nothing to do with that, so I'll mention at this point in time, simply to do with, with weed growth, um, or basically a non-herbicide-based programme. And noted that the, the costs of that were between 2 and 13 times um, the cost of the current glyphosate-based programme. Costs which we need to consider in the alternative include the day-to-day -day implementation, the maintenance, the revenue costs, and any machinery purchases and the additional time taken for these programs to be effective. So there have been studies done, um, and in section 2.9, um, we start to look at the approaches which a few other local authorities have taken towards the control of weeds. Okay, 
and towards the control of weeds um, in an integrated management program way, okay, that looks at glyphosate in, in appropriate locations, together with alternative methods, which as yet um, are untested and untried here. There are a number of alternative weed control techniques. They principally relate to the use of um, hot foam um, and steam to be applied to areas. And I'm pleased to say that the service has commenced the trial, particularly of the, the hot foam application. Um, but at this point in time, there has been one application. It would need three applications um, at week one, week four, and again at week eight throughout the growing season for us to understand uh, fully what the additional uh, implications. And when I say costs, I don't just mean in terms of monetary costs for the, the teams to for the, the hot foam itself, but also the, the costs in terms of carbon because the, the, the additional uh, fleet and manpower which is required to, to basically put the, the hot foam out. So we're going to undertake trials, hot foam um, and steam to assess the effect of insolvent, because that, of course, is important for them as, as well. Is it going to be effective in controlling our weed growth um, and, and what the costs are of implementing that? What we propose then, in summary, because we are extremely mindful of a service, as a service, of the concerns which the Council raised in its motions in terms of the use of glyphosate, is that at this point in time, there is no known quantifiable effective alternative. And what we propose to ensure that our communities are well served in terms of weed control, whilst we trial um, other alternatives, is that we take an integrated approach over a three year period, which mirrors um, the approach of the very few uh, local authorities who have moved away from the use of glyphosate. Now, based on the fact that the, the concerns, the health and environmental concerns over the use of glyphosate, given its principal use in the agriculture industry, and the very understandable concerns um, over human ingestion um, of that, we look to take a risk-based approach going forward. And the proposal is that anywhere that we apply glyphosate is not an area, for instance, in a park or green space, anywhere that um, the human contact could easily be made. So on a risk-based approach, that we would apply a glyphosate-based product only to um, pavement edges, road curb edges, et cetera, where the contact of uh, humans, and certainly not the ingestion, um, obviously, in foodstuffs, um, is less likely. Secondary to that um, is that we, we look to alternative methods within our parks and green spaces to make sure that we keep these, um, and in cemeteries as well, to keep these weeds under control. And over a three-year phased period, that we look to these alternative methods and that we bring back the outputs to the pilot study, including the costs in terms of manpower and resources, and also the costs um, environmentally in terms of carbon, et cetera, to the other alternative methods. There has been considerable time, effort, and energy spent by the team in trying to determine a glyphosate free future going forward. And I'm afraid at this point in time, it's not as clear cut for us um, to recommend to committee that, that it, it is easy to go forward with that because, as I say, there isn't a viable at scale effective alternative at this point in time. So my proposal to the committee today is in line with other local authorities who have gone down this route, is that we look to a managed three year programme so that we try to avoid as much uh, weed blight on our communities as possible, given the importance of environment, et cetera, that we've talked about even today at committee, and that we take forward um, at scale and if large scale trials um, of these alternative mechanisms and bring those back to committee so that you can make a, a considered decision on that. I'm conscious um, that that isn't entirely in line with the complete cessation, um, which was put forward in August, but I'm also extremely conscious, as I mentioned at the start, that as we enter the growing season with no industry viable at scale alternative, that we are at risk um, of our communities becoming quite overwhelmed, certainly with the blight of weeds. I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to um, expand on any points or answer any questions from members. Thanks for that. That was a very, uh, a very good insight into uh, 
where we are. Um, and thanks again for that, Nicole. Now, if see, we've got two people on the chat bar so far. We've got Councillor Anderson. Lynn, do you want to come in? Thanks, Chair. Um, I've got a wee rant and then I've got a question, if you'll indulge me. Um, I, I would like to refer to um, the last part, the last sentence in paragraph 2.11, which is page 74 of the papers. Which uh, the last part of the, the last sentence says, but in most cases, any herbicide loss to the road drainage network would be treated at the wastewater treatment plant to control levels before release to the aquatic environment. Um, that statement isn't correct. And I'm concerned that its inclusion in the report might mislead some of my colleagues here today. Uh, for around uh, 25 years, there's been significant work done to de dual old combined systems, and any developments since in, in that period of time have required separate systems. So, in fact, glyphosate washed into the road drainage network is more likely to end up in a water course, um, especially in our climate. The, the combined system, the remaining combined systems, um, spill into water courses in heavy rainfall, which we know is not exactly rare. Um, Wastewater treatment works are not designed to treat herbicides, so I find that misleading as well. Um, it's, it, it's glyphosate and other herbicides are not a parameter in any discharge authorization that I'm aware of, so the controlled levels that are referred to in this report doesn't make sense to me. Uh, overall, I'm uncomfortable with the implication of that paragraph um, that the solution to pollution is dilution, and that's not a great message. Um, and I would like to ask why three years? I, I, I totally appreciate um, we've had, you know, the COVID. Uh, there's been delays. Um, I'm, I'm a bit concerned. Three years is quite a long time. Um, so I would like, I would, I would like an answer to that. Thanks. Thanks, for that one. Uh, Nicole, do you want to come in and answer any questions there, please? Yeah, of course, convener. So, council, uh, first question. Uh, first of all, um, now I'm not going to proclaim to be uh, an expert, uh, neither in weed control um, nor in the very complex report which this was um, drawn from. It has been uh, challenging, I would say, for the, the, the team in terms of the, the, the background to glyphosate and the concerns around it. All the information has been drawn, um, as shown in 1.4 from the the, the NIAB EMR report, um, which was carried out by indeed specialists in genetics, genomics, including crop science and production systems. Um, so hopefully from those uh, more able to comment. Um, I take on board um, the members' comments. In reality, the paper tries to present a pragmatic view. Um, I'm happy to go back and double check, triple check um, in terms of the information uh, and certainly the information provided today. The reality is, uh, and I, I go back to it again, that we at this current time have no viable alternative in line with other local authorities. And the three year uh, programme in terms of uh, an integrated uh, pesticide control system um, really follows one, sorry, an IPM um, approach really follows the path that other local authorities have taken because what, what that requires is a focus which isn't on weed treatment, but on weed prevention. And if we shift our focus towards weed prevention, right, and that requires a, um, a number of different actions from us, which again have different um, implications in terms of manpower, uh, resourcing and costs, then we would move more to mechanical sweeping. Okay, so you try to present prevent the weed growth uh, in road channels, the pavement edges, much of the weed growth occurs. This um, and the, the soil material, which ends up deposited at the side of roads, if we can get that way faster, then the chances of weeds uh, being able to, to germinate in that space is much, much lesser. We reduce the weed tolerance for levels in each area. Um, but the, the reality is we're still at the starting position where there are very few viable alternatives and they will need determined at scale, and we will need to get the right treatment in the right place. But I do want to be very clear with members. I haven't brought this paper lightly. I don't condone the, the continued use of glyphosate. We are trying to find a pragmatic way forward 
on a risk-based approach so that we can effectively treat the position that we have currently in the local authority and we can move towards a more managed and hopefully a more acceptable position over a period of time. But this is not an overnight solution because the solutions aren't there. Thanks for that, Nicole. Um, Lynn, are you quite happy with that? I am. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks. Thanks. Now, I've got another couple of speakers in the chat bar. First and foremost, uh, Councillor Goldie, Willie. Thanks, Convener. It's just really to intimate that we do have an amendment uh, for this, and we'll, we'll pass it on to Mark. And I'm quite happy to uh, wait until the end of the speakers on that and then move that. Uh, I've not really got any other comments to make that. I do realise this is an extremely difficult situation and I do sympathise with the officers and I've, I've made that known directly to Nicole. Uh, but we do have an amendment to move, but I'm quite happy to hold my fire just now. Cheers. That's fine. We'll leave that to the end of uh, the, the proceedings here and we'll, we'll deal with that in time. Councillor Hall, Paddy, you've put in question and comment. On you go. Thanks, Convener. Um, just to say um, thanks to Nicole for um, for the paper. Um, I'm a bit disappointed that it's based so strongly on basically um, cost effectiveness that we basically can't afford to um, to cease the use of glyphosate. I'd like to make some points. One relation to um, point two four that the reports of glyphosate toxicity in humans are inconsistent. I've already circulated um, an email to colleagues, which one it comes from the plantpathology.com science paper, which shows up to date information that tends to um, prove that quite often when we analyze or when scientists analyze the the toxicity of glyphosate, they tend to ignore an adjuvant called POEA, which is much more lethal than glyphosate itself. So the dice is quite often loaded as to its toxicity. And um, most of us will know of the two groundsmen who um, it was proved in court that they were they received cancer from from the use of this. And there's a very recent paper from January the 15th, 2020, and, um, and it's about how glyphosate inhibits the shikimate pathway in the human microbiome, not just in plants. So we have stronger evidence growing year upon year of the actual harms of, um, of glyphosate itself and the link with not just cancers, but with autism even if it's an association. So I'm quite concerned if we're saying in a sort of hardball sense that we can't afford to stop it. If we can run a trial this summer, I don't see why we shouldn't keep this suspended. And I would actually prefer a full look at the risk benefit analysis that is on offer to councillors at the end of the report. I haven't seen that, but with my knowledge of this, and looking into it in details and having moved it in the past, I think there's a fair possibility in the future, given that there's upwards of 50,000 lawsuits against Monsanto in the um, pipeline, that once more and more stuff gets into the media of the damage that this substance can cause, that we will find more pet owners, we'll find more people, even, even if we're deciding to target away from schools and parks, etc. that's an acknowledgement of the potential lethality of the toxicity of the substance. And as Councillor Anderson said, there is more proof that it gets into water courses. There's actually more and more evidence showing that almost one third of the soil on planet Earth has been damaged by glyphosate, given the, its extensive use in farming. So there is um, global damage being done by this that fits into the whole climate change or climate damage um, factors. So I think given these, I, I, I couldn't support uh, um, a reintroduction of this because I think we'll, we're going to end up with complaints. And I don't see why we couldn't be asking staff to um, literally strimmer where the weeds are worst. And I, I don't see there was going to be massive outcry about weeds if we simply strim them. I think sometimes the simplest solutions are the best. And basically, that's my contribution. I'm interested to see what what Councillor Goldie's amendment is going to be. 
Thanks, convener. Thanks for that, Paddy. Um, what I will say at the outset before bringing the call back in, it's great to say let's you know, just trim it and that will uh, solve the problem. But you've got to take into consideration, Paddy, as you well know, from 2012 to the now, the land services, which would be dealing with the, the strimming and cleaning of weeds, has went from about 750 men or uh, employees down to just under three, 300 now. So that that is not that that is probably not even an option anymore. Nicole, would you like to come in and answer uh, some of the questions or points that Paddy made there, please? Of course, convener. Thank you. Um, so I take your points, Councillor Hogg. For, first of all, I want to be very clear, and I hope the paper makes it clear that these decisions are simply about cost effectiveness, but actually about the effectiveness of treatment. And I suppose building in convener's point that we do have to understand the, the cost implications for them because as a service, um, now whether we strim, and that's a fair point, yes, we, 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 we could strim them, but that is extremely resource intensive. We can absolutely apply the foam. And from the very, very first trial that I've seen of the foam, it actually, at least in the immediate term, looks highly effective. But I also know that it is again very, very resource intensive to apply, and therefore I need I, I need as a as as the head of service to be aware and and to make uh, members aware of these implications as well. Because the convener's point is well made, the resources are there at this point in time to to extend to the use or application of any of these. But what I would say is it's not to say that any of these ways forward will be wrong. I simply have to complete the trials and, and be very clear on what the additional resource requirements are and the additional cost requirements are. Um, in terms of uh, strumming, yep, as I say, we absolutely could, but there are still the other two options that we could undertake as well. What we want to, want to understand is which of these will be effective, because as we know, and I, certainly I've experienced it in my garden, when I strum weeds, when I strum glass down, they come through really, really quickly again. So we can't afford to, to keep, and I mean in terms of time now as well, just to keep repeating these actions because um, we have more than 3,000 kilometres of roads and footways. It, it's, an extreme, uh, it's an extremely large estate which we're trying to manage. So in that respect, the service does need some time to uh, trial these other uh, opportunities. But I would take you back again to the IPM approach which is one about prevention. So we need to get ourselves on the front foot to be able to do that preventative work as well and to understand the increase in mechanical street sweeping, et cetera, that would be required to allow us to get on that front foot. So I want to be very clear with members today. The paper hasn't been brought lightly. Uh, I in no way condone the way that they use of glyphosate. My, my concern, first and foremost, is for the safety of my teams and also that of our communities. But I also have to ensure that the environmental quality within communities is high as well. So, as I say, the timing of this report um, is such that I do need to make members aware that as we move into the summer period, we don't have an effective alternative method of weed control or removal. But there are many pilots which we are taking forward and which we will bring back the results of to committee. Thanks, Matt Nicole. Pat, Paddy, I have to see you want to interview a sub supplementary. Yep. Thanks, Camilla. Yeah, appreciate that, Nicole. Um, certainly a hard ball place to be in. But, um, my concerns too are for staff. So I would not like to see the council sued because someone in the next year or so ends up with some form of cancer and we end up having to pay out 100 or th maybe 100 million or so. It was $289 million that was paid out. So I think this is um, one where we should err on the, on the side of caution. That's just my opinion, though. Thanks, Davina. Yeah, Barry, um, you know, I, I appreciate your opinion, but again, the 289 million, I think that was due to a crops being sprayed, and it's a completely you know, different set, set of circumstances we're dealing with here. Um, can I just be a, be a... point out that was a groundsman who worked at schools. Also, could I suggest that? Hold on a second, Paddy. Paddy, Paddy, can I ask you to come down? Paddy, you know, you've been in twice now, so we have got to move on uh, to the Anne Weir. Thanks, convener. Um, 
Nicole, your main argument seems to be um, money. Um, can I just, and you, that there's no viable alternatives when it comes back to money. Um, can I ask you what Hammersmith and Fulham and Brighton and Hove envisage using uh, to get their uh, areas glyphosate free um, and why they've got the money and we have now? <laughs> Do you want me to answer that, Anne? <laughs> Don't start me. Okay, so I suppose I want to be very clear again, right? The starting point for this paper was as we approach the summer season, at this point in time, for the scale of areas that require treatment that we have in North Lanarkshire, we don't have an, a, a, an effective alternative, okay? However, from the trials, may we, we may well find through a combination of measures an effective alternative. But in finding that effective alternative, I have to be very, I have to be very clear on the resource implications for the teams because it will be additional work in terms of what we, we have done previously, hence the benchmark of the two treatments, to be honest, at scale and at speed. And again, I'm going to be very clear, I, I, I do not advocate for that. I just present the baseline and what the work package currently is. And I have to be very clear in terms of the, the resource implications and the cost to the council of that going forward so that I can make you aware of that. In terms of the, the other local authorities, and to be honest, the very few who have taken a, 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 an alternative approach, it is this IPM um, method, and, and that's why we present it in the paper because it is this phased approach, and, and I'll say again, away from the treatment of weeds which appear, to a move much more towards potential prevention. That potential prevention, and I say potential because it requires a much higher degree of mechanical sweeping, um, et cetera, as well, to try and keep them away. It requires looking at, if we think about our cemeteries, for example, many of which are blaze paths, that we move to a different path surface rather than having blaze, which allows the weeds to come through. If you have a, a solid surface, that's much less likely. So it's, it's a complex um, situation and it's not simply that we can swap out glyphosate for something else. And it, it can be carried out by the teams in the same way. It takes the same time and therefore the same cost. So I apologise if the cost issue has come through so strongly. The key is that the teams are very clear that we need to find an alternative, but we're also very clear it needs to be effective and that we, we need to be able to apply it. So the, really the, the discussion today is to say starting point, this is where we're at. We don't use what we've got or we use it in very limited quantities. And we need to get ourselves to a position like the other local authorities quoted where the transition over three years, but I'm afraid the reality is ahead of services. I do need to be mindful of the cost and resources which are required because I guess there are two options. One of which is that we stop doing other work um, to allow us to do this alternative programme, um, or indeed that we need to seek additional resources to implement this programme. But I do want to be very clear with members that no point am I saying that we're not, or again, that I condone the use of glyphosate. I don't, I just try to prevent, present in quite a difficult set of circumstances, a, a, a pragmatic way forward for the council. And I'm mindful, of course, that there's a motion to move as well. So I'll stop there. Michael, I'm trying Thank to get you. in, but my uh, Mary, Mary, is I'm not just, working. I was just going to bring you in, Mary. I've seen you waving I'm sorry. Councillor I totally agree with everything that's been said against the chemical. Um, but we do know from experience that nothing is working. And the last two years, I don't know about any other constituency, but mines in particular, we got leathered because of the state of our roadways, our, our paths, our, our cemeteries, when we stopped using the chemical. And it's all right saying um, it's down to money. Of course, it's down to money. And our budgets in every department over the last, from 207 right up to the present day is being cut by 300 million. Whether we like it or not, that is a fact of life. For to say that we're going to trial it over a three year period, nobody likes it. But we've got to be realistic to the people out there. They're not interested. All they want is clear pavements, clear roads. 
the graveyard, we know the kick up with the graveyard that we had last year and the year before. I think Michael was nearly hung, dried and quartered. So I think we need to be a wee bit real to say we know all the problems, but on a short term, let's be realistic. Thank you. Thanks for that, Mary. Um, Paddy, I see your the comment in the, the, the chat bar there. I think as a service in the county council, um, we would always we would always put the uh, health and safety of our workers at, at the for, forefront. Nicole, do you want to come in and answer, uh, make a comment there? Thank you, convener. I'd very much welcome coming in. And the comment was made earlier in terms of uh, health and safety risks to our operatives. Um, now, we know that if each and every activity um, and each and every um, activity which our operatives undertake um, comes with some risk, and therefore each and every activity is risk assessed. We ensure that our operatives are very well trained and that every, every single mitigation that can be put in place to keep them safe is done so. So I just want to be very clear that um, if we talk about glyphosate, that is a, a, a chemical which, we, which we've used for some years and that oh, safe systems of work, risk assessments, uh, PPE that's required is all in place to keep our operatives safe. That is absolutely paramount for me and it's absolutely paramount for the teams. And just as we look at alternatives, those risk assessments, um, etc. Safe systems of work will all be developed and undertaken as well to ensure that the teams can can take whichever route that we determine is appropriate uh, forward safely. It's absolutely paramount, and I cannot echo it enough. Thanks for that, uh, Nicole. I don't see any further comments, in the, the or people want to come in in the chat bar. So I'm going to go back to Councillor uh, Goldie and ask you to bring forward your amendment, Willie. I think, I think uh, Mark's got a copy of it. If you could share it, it would be fine. I'll give you the opportunity to have a quick read at it. I'll start doing my wee bit while that's coming up anyway. Uh, just at the committee today, agenda items two and three highlighted damage to our environment due to global warming. And at our previous council meeting, we highlighted potential risks to the environment caused by glyphosate, including risks to human health. We recognise these risks when, as a council, we ceased its use in 2020. Now, I don't intend to cover all these risks again because as a council, we accepted them and we went for the cessation of glyphosate. Now, on Tuesday, as part of Act 21, we heard an excellent poem written by school pupils about the damage done to our planet. Now, these included a section of pollinators, likes of bees and that all dying off. Reintroducing glyphosate was exacerbated this and caused greater harm. Now, as I've said earlier, I've got every sympathy with our officers on this. This is not an easy decision. But to reintroduce glyphosate would not sit comfortably, as there is always potential to reach our water courses through drainage, as Lynn alluded to earlier on, and possibly even enter the food chain. We've been using alternative methods, and the early trial results we hope for are extremely encouraging. So, colleagues, I think we made the right decision when we ceased glyphosate use. Please don't reverse it today, even in a limited capacity. And for the sake of our environment, please support our amendment. That's as much as I've got to say. I think everything else has been covered, convener. Cheers. Thanks for that, Wally. Thanks for being uh, as brief there. Uh, Wally, do you have somebody to second that? Yeah, Councillor Carragher is going to second it. Tracy, uh, Councillor Carragher, would you like to say anything and second it? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I really do appreciate um, the difficulties here. Um, but I'm afraid I, I wouldn't feel comfortable supporting um, the original um, recommendations to council. I don't. I don't think we can accept the risk until we find an alternative. We've just, we, you know, we're currently going through like a, a pandemic right now where health is everybody's priority. Um, so I, I mean, I, I'm. I feel comfortable supporting. Um, my group's amendment to this, and I really would encourage all other members to support it. Whilst I actually do appreciate the difficulties that that will bring to the service. Thanks. Thanks, for that, uh, uh, Tracy. Now, before we go to the vote, I'm going to give the opportunity. Without going back on old uh, arguments, and I'm going to give MD else who has not been in um, a chance to come in with. Now they've seen the amendment. Now, uh, so I'll leave the. Uh, that up just for a minute or two to see if anybody wants to come in to make any comment. Oh, 
okay, well, it's quite obvious nobody wants to come in. That's fine. So, Mark, can we go to the vote as I will be um, going with the, the recommendations in the original report? And I'll ask uh, for my seconder, Nora. Nora, do you want to say anything? Thanks very much, convener. Um, yeah, it's it's a difficult situation, um, and I, you know, as an advocate for the environment, um, I do appreciate everyone's concerns. But in light of the fact that there isn't a suitable alternative, and there are the budget cuts that we have faced over the last ten years, um, I feel that we're in a position just now where the risk assessments have been done by the relevant officers. Um, and that that satisfies the criteria for me to to approve the motion. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay, over to you, Mark. We'll go to the vote. Thanks, convener. Just to clarify that the motion will be from yourself to move the recommendations of the report, and the amendment will be from Councillor Goldie. Just when elected members are putting forward um, on the propositions, I'll go through the elected members, and then I'll I'll, I'll refer to the substitutes at, at the end, convener, if that's okay. Um, so we'll start, start off with Councillor Anderson. Amendment. Councillor Ashraf. Amendment. Councillor Carica. Amendment. Councillor Cullen. Motion. Councillor Damasio. Amendment. Councillor Doolan. Amendment. Councillor Douglas. Motion. Councillor Duffy. Motion. Councillor Goldie. Amendment. Councillor Gourley. It might, uh, what was it? Um, we're Michael. Sorry about that. The proposition Somebody with, 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 with Councillor uh, McPay was for, was for the motion. Motion. Councillor Hogg. <laughs> Amendment, obviously. Thanks to the SNP. Colleagues for doing this. Councillor Lennon. Amendment Mark. Thank you. Councillor McManus. Amendment. Councillor McNeil. Motion. Councillor McPake. Motion. Councillor Mooney. Motion. Councillor Reading. Motion. Councillor Stocks. Amendment. Councillor Weir. Amendment. Sorry, Councillor Valentine first. Sorry, apologies, Councillor Weir. Amendment. And Councillor Weir, you were amendment too, yes? Yeah. yeah. Councillor Woods. Motion. Thank you, Councillor Woods. Councillor Curran. Motion. And finally, Councillor Shields. Motion. Oh, thank you very much. The amendment attracted 12 votes and the motion attracted 11 votes, so the amendment is carried. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Thanks for that, Mark. Uh, moving on, colleagues, to item nine on the agenda, which is Amy Public Services Limited, LLP, sorry, Operation and Financial Performance Monitoring Report from October 2020 to March 21, and it's on page 70 uh, 90 of your papers. This is here from noting colleagues. So I'll just ask for any comments or questions regarding this report. I don't see any questions, so we're happy to note the top contents of the report, colleagues. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item number 10, and the last item on your uh, papers today is contracts awarded below committee approval threshold, and it's in pages 91 to 94. Again, colleagues, this is here for noting. Is there any comments or questions on this item? 
I don't see any in the chat bar. So, colleagues, can I ask you to approve uh, to note the contents of the report? Agreed. Thank you very much. Colleagues, that brings us to the end of today's meeting. Can I thank you all very well, uh, very much for a very interesting and uh, productive meeting. Thanks very much. Well, thanks, thanks to the Chair.